Good morning, family. Good morning. Oh, that sounded so nice. I think I want to hear it one more time. Good morning, family. Good morning. Okay, you sound like you're ready to celebrate just like I am. So we're gonna we're gonna begin with uh, a, a, a tribute. Actually, Jim, if you would step up here. Okay, you're actually looking at the tribute today. As Jim and I both are wearing neckties to honor the fathers. My dad at home in Maryland and all the fathers that are with us today. So on this occasion, we like to wish all the fathers a very happy Father's Day. And so I don't know about you, but from last week's sermon all week long, man, I, I was just like, appreciate Jesus today. Appreciate Jesus today. Appreciate Jesus in this moment. So guess what? We're here to worship and praise our God. So we got another opportunity to appreciate Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. So church, arise and put your armor on. Please stand and hear the call of Christ, our captain. Church, arise and put your armor on. Hear the call of Christ our captain. For now the weak can say that they are strong in the strength that God has given. With shield of faith and belt of truth, we'll stand against the devil's lies. An army bold whose battle cry is love, reaching out to those in darkness. Our call to war, to love the captive soul, but to rage against the captor. And with the sword that makes the wounded whole, we will fight with faith and valor. When faced with trials on every side, we know the outcome is secure. And Christ will have the price for which he died, an inheritance of nations. Come see the cross where love and mercy meet. As the Son of God is stricken, then see his foes lie crushed beneath his feet. For the conqueror has risen, and as the stone is rolled away, and Christ emerges from the grave, this victory march continues till the day. Every eye and heart shall see him. So spirit come, put strength in every stride. Give us grace for every hurdle. That we may run with faith to win the prize. Of a servant good and faithful. As saints of old still lie the way. Retelling triumphs of his grace. We hear their calls and hunger for the day. When with Christ we stand in glory. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. God is good all the time. All the time. Amen. 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 Well, let me just say also uh, to everyone here, to to uh, to guys especially, Happy Father's Day to everyone. Happy uh, beautiful worship day to each and every one of you. Heavenly Father, Happy Father's Day. Amen. 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 I am so. Uh, 
Glad that you are here, and uh, what a privilege it is always on a Sunday morning to to greet uh, first-time guests that come in to join us for worship. Uh, sometimes Father's Day, like Mother's Day, is a day where things kind of empty out a little bit. Everybody's going off to do everything to celebrate in their family, but you being here is really special to us. We're grateful for that. If it is your first time as our guest, uh, please connect with us if you would. Uh, there's a card in the pocket of the seat in front of you called a connection card. So grab that out there and, and fill in whatever you feel comfortable sharing about yourself, especially if you happen. Now, maybe you're here just because it is Father's Day and you're with family, but if you're especially also looking for uh, a church home, maybe some spiritual truths, there's some way that we might be able to communicate with you. The connection card's a good first step. Take this at the end of the service, if you would, please, to the Connection Center. That's the counter on the left as you're heading in that direction. And somebody will be standing there with a big smiling face to hand you a gift of appreciation because we truly appreciate that you've come to worship with us uh, today. As always, church family, I invite you to open up your bulletins. Hope you got one because there's also uh, an important insert that I'm not going to read to you, but I'm going to expect you to read. You'll find it important, especially if you don't get one and miss an event that's important to you. But the first one you should come across is your listening guide, your learning tool. Today, we're going to wrap up Mark chapter 13 in our series called It's All About Jesus. Ready or not, here I come. And, uh, and, and I got something to share with you at the end of the service about uh, th this more recent uh, chapter and uh, how it is reaching a number of people uh, throughout the world. Take this, open your Bible, please, to uh, Mark chapter uh, 13, bookmark it in there. We'll get to God's word just a little bit later. Likewise, if uh, the, you'll see a second insert in there, and this is kind of updating you for uh, things are going to heat up a little bit, shall we say, in church. And I'm not talking about the weather that we've been experiencing lately. Just some great activities. I want to draw your attention to next Sunday. Next Sunday is, uh, it's titled here, Summerfest Fellowship, but it's a good old-fashioned Baptist fellowship, potluck, so to speak. Except this time we're going to do you know, burgers and dogs on the grill. So we're asking you to sign up for the sides and, of course, the desserts. Some of you guys are, you know, Publix is always great. There is a sign up at Connection Center just so that we see all what to expect. So before you leave today, check out the, uh, the, the fellowship sign up and put your name down there accordingly. Uh, ju just for those that, you know... It, just to give an announcement, next Sunday would typically be our Lord's Supper celebration. For a number of reasons, I'm postponing it to the next week, July 3. So just be aware of that. Some time ago, our sister Judy Brown went to be with the Lord. And at that time, it was said that there would be no memorial. Well, things have changed and, uh, and we are going to be able to have the privilege to celebrate her life. According to uh, her husband and her family, uh, we're going to do this on July 3. It is a Wednesday uh, at about 11 o'clock, maybe 11.30 or so. It's in there. Mark it on your account if you'd like to come celebrate her life, perhaps even from now till then. Think about how she might have impacted your life. I realize that Judy had been uh, ill for so long that some of you coming into the church may have never had the, the blessing of getting to know her. But I, I, I huh? What did I say? Oh, I was reading Lord's Supper. But you're right. Thank you. Thank you. July 6th. It's a Wednesday. Okay. So uh, then there's some other things there we'll hit on. But I also want to um, mention, even though it's far out, especially for everybody listening in YouTube land, uh, a very special summer event involving children and families is called Five Day Club. And, it's, and I'll read it correctly here. July 18th. To 22, 18 to 22. There's information there and should be on our website for signing up and so forth. Kids, you don't want to miss five-day club. 
It is fun. I mean, the adults have a lot of fun, uh, even just having fun with the kids. So um, um, anyway, just be uh, aware of that. So this is the point in time when I normally get myself into trouble, saying things that offend people and upset people and, and all that kind of stuff. But I am very sincere as, well, let me just say this. I'm often blessed that even in a prayer circle, in a worship service, in a Bible study, I'm often surrounded by beautiful women. But what becomes obvious is the absence of men. And while we celebrate Father's Day, one of the missing links in our society today is the Father. And God's biblical plan for family started with a father. And so it is not hard to figure out that when so many men are MIA in the family unit today, there is a crippling of our society. I want to take this opportunity not only to praise you fathers for your faithfulness to, to uh, your family, your wife and your children, uh, faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ and setting the proper example of being in church, leading your family to church. Yeah, you are truly an example because there are so many men in this world that don't see the value of that. And uh, take it from somebody that I love my dad. He was always there for me, but not in the godly manner. And so, um, but pray, you know, who's your one? Pray, pray for men who don't know the Lord. Pray for men that aren't accompanying their wives to church or being with them in a Bible study. We need to pray for a revival, but particularly in the hearts of men in today's world. So uh, if you're not terribly offended by that, I'm going to ask you if you would please uh, join me. Heavenly Father, and what a, a great privilege, honor to be able to call you Father. That even in a world where fathers is a dirty word, it, it represents a broken heart, a, a hurtful situation where men were not there, where men were mean and abusive. Heavenly Father, you have always been good. When we say God is good, Lord, it is you that we think about. We thank you, Lord, for the way that you have loved us even when we have not loved you in return. Your love is unconditional. It, there is a biblical precedence of you as our Father, even throughout all of this broken uh, war, uh, history of humanity. Uh, fathers have not stepped up to be who you have made us and created us to be. And Lord, I am in the foremost of that line, not been what you had called me to be. I thank you for your grace and your mercy to save me and turn my life around. But Lord, sometimes the damage is done. I pray with all heart sincerity, Lord, for men in this world who are dads or have the responsibility of being a father to a child, whether it's stepdad or dad, to be a father according to your good and holy word, the example that you have set for us. And Lord, as I even posted on social media today, men, teach your sons to be gentlemen. Or raise your sons to be gentlemen and teach your daughters to accept nothing less. <clears throat> Father, I just ask that you do a great work of healing. In this church body where it's, uh, where it's needed, all throughout where my voice is heard this morning, that we give you thanks and praise for who you are. We thank you, Lord, for giving us godly fathers where you have 
And we pray for those that, that if they're still alive, their lives can be radically changed and turned around. I thank you, Lord, that you are a God of second chances. You are a God that loves us and filled with grace and mercy. And so, Lord, as we recognize you highly and exalted on this Father's Day, I pray for nothing less than a miracle in the lives of men today and, as, and the role they play as Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Who am I that the God of creation would think of me? Who am I, <clears throat> excuse me, that the God of creation would make it possible for me to love him? Who are we? That God would sacrifice his son because he loved us. That we might have a pathway to love him in relationship with him. Because church, it's all about Jesus. And as you stand and sing with us, lift your souls and sing how great thou art. Oh, 
proclaim my God how great thou art then sings my soul my Savior God to thee God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Amen. Hallelujah. How great thou art. We can all, especially those of us who have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, can wonder in the amazement of his grace. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed my chains are gone my God, my Savior, has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing
Amazing grace. Amazing grace. If you acknowledge that amazing grace that's covered your life, how can you not say thank you? There is indeed so, so much to thank God for. church. Father in heaven, we are assembled today just thanking you for this opportunity to say thank you, Lord. Jesus, we thank you. How we love you and we gratefully thank you for this opportunity today, Lord, just to come into the house of worship and be free to show you just how much we love you with our praise, 
with our prayers, with our amens, with our hearts of love. We thank you for this opportunity. Not only to assemble, Lord, but to, but to have the opportunity to hear your word spoken publicly and to be able to hear from you, from the man that you have placed on this mantle, Lord. So we thank you for our pastor today. We thank you for our musicians today. We thank you for the worship team today. We thank you for the leaders of our church today. We thank you for the members of our church today. We thank you for the ministries of our church today. We thank you for the life groups of our church today. We thank you for the Bible studies of our church today. Lord, we just want to thank you for those in the AB, AV booth that help make this possible. And Lord, we just ask that you would touch not only the hearts of those under the sound of my voice, Lord, but the hearts of those who may be watching on the video and YouTube land, as the pastor says, Lord. Give them, Father, a heart of love that they would desire to be in your presence and come from home to the sanctuary where you meet us, Lord, and you bless us, Lord, and you grace us, Lord, with your presence. And so we ask now, Lord, that as the word comes, that you would continue to mold our hearts, Lord. You are the potter. We are the clay. Mold us and make us this day, Lord, have your own way. Amen. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, worship team. Boy. I tell you, that music has truly ministered to my heart. Church family is a, another school year ends and the summer days are getting longer. Yeah, a little bit hotter too. But I am reminded of one of the most uh, memorable games in my, from my childhood days. Hide and seek. Now, back then, people weren't as sensitive to kids running through their yards at dusk. And boy, well, I tell you, we, we had some great hiding places where I grew up with the Florida Palmettos all behind uh, our house. Uh, I bet you remember that as well, uh, it, where you grew up. But you know, when the game started, somebody was chosen to be it, right? And a spot was chosen to be home base. And whoever was it would stand there at base, close their eyes, and count to 100. The other, plays, the other players would, would run and hide, and then it was its job to go find everyone before they could return to base. Right? The game ended when everyone made it back to home base or when it found someone who was hiding. Uh, in the next game, the person who was caught became it. Sound familiar? Yes. The part of the game that still echoes in my mind is what it would say before he or she came looking for those who were hiding. Ready or not, here I come. And when, when it said that, you better be ready or you're in trouble. In last week's passage from Mark's chapter 13, our sermon series called uh, It's All About Jesus, Jesus spoke directly to his second coming. And today we're going to continue with two parables that Jesus felt was necessary to communicate a, a strong sense of urgency for his followers to be prepared for this life-altering event. And whether it directly includes us today or some generation of people to come in the future, we must be ready do you know when Jesus is going to come again? No, you don't. And when Jesus says to us, 
ready or not, here I come. How prepared will you be? Chapter 13, if you remember, began with the disciples marveling over the temple's beauty. Look, teacher, said one of his disciples, look at what these wonderful stones, what wonderful buildings. And, and Jesus replied, well, there's not going to be one stone left upon another that won't be thrown down. And so Peter, J Andrew, James, and John came to Jesus later and said, tell us, when are these things going to be? What will be the signs they're about to be accomplished? And this began a valuable teaching we call the Olivet Discourse because it occurred right there, Jesus' teaching on the Mount of Olives. Well, Jesus warned his disciples, be on guard for you will be persecuted and beaten on account of me. That, and, you will, and, and see that nobody leads you astray. You're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. Um, but don't let this be a sign of the end. There will be earthquakes and famines. And, and still, this is, these things have to happen. They will be the beginning of the suffering that will occur. Family is going to turn against family and you will be hated for my name's sake. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at one of Jesus' horrifying prophecies that he called the abomination of desolation. And there was a, a certainly a historical event uh, in Jeru at Jerusalem's temple, A.D. 70. And it will likely occur again sometime at the end of time, a desolating sacrilege. An abomination, if you remember, is something that causes dis uh, disgust or, or hatred. And desolation means it's a, a state of complete emptiness or destruction. Jesus said that when this occurs in the temple, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains to avoid a mass destruction that's about to follow. Jesus then moved on to the subject of the coming of the Son of Man, that is, his second coming. Now, hear Jesus' words from verse 24 of this chapter. But in those days after the tribulation, he says... The sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from the heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Jesus' primary concern for his disciples was their protection from the deception of false teachers who would try to lead his people astray. Chapter 13 is not about signs and timetables, my friends. It's about discernment. It's about not being fooled with people who are full of signs and timetables. And so these closing verses that we look at today in chapter 13 offer a warning that all people of all ages should take heart. Jesus is coming. Amen. And he is coming very soon. This is not a childhood game. Eternity is at stake. Ready or not, here I come is is a challenge for all saints to be ready and it is also a, a calling for the lost to be saved. Amen. Jesus is coming and you do not want to be caught off guard. It's all about Jesus. Mark chapter 13 with your Bibles open. Let's begin reading God's word together in uh, verse 28. I'm in the ESV, English Standard Version, with your favorite translation in hand. Would you please stand with me if you're able to uh, join me in the reading, to honor the reading of God. From the fig tree learn its lesson. 
As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake. But you do not know when the time, for you do not, do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Let us pray together. Father, as we read these words, I'd, this has been an intense uh, chapter. It has drawn the attention of a lot of people, especially those who are listening and watching on YouTube land. Father, I pray that uh, it gets our attention particularly in these final words and the impact that Jesus wants to truly communicate in answering his disciples' question, when is all of this going to happen? What does it mean? What should we take away from all of this? And so, Lord, by the power of your spirit, I pray that you open up the eyes of our hearts that we might see you. But, Lord, if there is anyone here today that does not know you, I pray that they are especially sensitive to your word and are drawn closer to you. Perhaps even convicted of sin and seeking salvation. For it honors and glorifies you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, church. Please be seated. In our text, Jesus told two parables to answer his disciples' question, when will all of these things be accomplished? The first parable that Jesus told is about a fig tree. From the fig tree, learn its lesson, he said. As soon as its branches become tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. Now, a fig tree is a deciduous tree. That is, it, it sheds its leaves in the fall and it grows new ones in the spring. Uh, this was spring when this was happening. And so uh, the tree served as a good illustration for Jesus. In Mark chapter 12, the fig tree represented Israel, which is why Jesus cursed it for its rebellion and its disobedience to God. Now, some people like to take the meaning of, of a parable in, in the Gospels and want to try to make it fit into someplace else in the Gospels, like trying to hammer, you know, a round peg into a square hole or something like that, which is the reason why Luke actually declares for us why this is not necessarily true in all cases. Luke says in, about this this same context here, chapter 21, verse 29, and Jesus told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. So Jesus is using the fig tree that's sprouting new leaves in the springtime to just serve as an illustration. Jesus said that when you see the tips of the branches of the fig tree grow green, you know the summer is near. So here's the point, and it's on, on your listening guide as well, folks. In the same way that they could interpret the season by the leaves on the trees, so the disciples would be able to know when the significant events would occur. That's his illustration. Verse 29, so also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. 
It's a little bit of a controversial statement there. Some scholars feel that the phrase, he is near, actually refers back to verse 14, the desecration of the temple. However, I believe Jesus is way too skillful of a communicator to leave his disciples confused in a daze by switching his subjects back and forth between the desecration of the temple and his second coming. He wants them to get the point, not become more confused, especially in the confusing days that these men are going to face uh, when Jesus is crucified. Jesus is concluding this Olivet Discourse with these two parables. The conversation is coming to an end. Jesus is landing the plane, so to speak. So verse 29 means that the second coming of Jesus is near. He's on the subject of his second coming. Likewise, Luke says in, in chapter 21 of verse 31, so also when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. That's not a reference to the destruction of the temple. In verse 30, Jesus said, well, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Well, a biblical generation... It's roughly 40 years. True, Jesus is speaking here at about A.D. 30, so that when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem in A.D. 70, well, for, that was about 40 years later. So if Jesus were talking about the temple destruction alone, in general, that generation did not pass away until Jesus' words were accomplished, even though his own disciples would never have seen it happen. Why? Because all except John, they were all martyred for Christ's kingdom cause. I get all that. However, I want us to see that if, if Jesus is staying on track with leading his disciples in their understanding, um, the, the most reasonable interpretation is that this generation actually refers to the people who will be living at the end time who will view these signs. Why? Well, in a partial answer to the disciples' questions concerning the when of his coming... Jesus said it's going to occur very soon after all of those signs are witnessed before this generation who sees them pass away. So when you see these things, he said that knowing full well that his own men that he's directly talking to would never see these things because they'd be killed. Jesus is speaking this same uh, prophetically distant you. The you, he's, he's been talking about all throughout this chapter. When Jesus said these words, when you see these things, he is speaking as some of the Old Testament prophets used to say, as, they were, as if they were standing directly before all the future generations. And then, he says, heaven and earth will pass away. But my words will not pass away. I just say praise the Lord to that. But on another occasion, he also said it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. So Jesus said, to this, to exp said this to express the enduring quality of the word of God. Let's not forget that, folks the enduring quality of God's word. See, the universe will fail. The universe will, uh, what was that song that we sang uh, in Amazing Grace? Will dissolve, you know, like snow. But what Jesus has just said will never fail. Will never fail because it will come to complete fulfillment. You can bank on that. So here's Jesus' answer to what the disciples really wanted to know. But concerning that day or that hour, 
Verse 32, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but only the father. Ready or not, here I come. Be on guard. Keep awake. For you do not know when that time will come. I assure you, today, Jesus knows when he will return. However, in his humanity on earth, Jesus intentionally limited his divine attributes to remain fully dependent upon the Father. Just as our relationship with God, our Heavenly Father, should be fully dependent. You know, it's, it's no coincidence that early in John's gospel, Jesus performed his first miracle. Remember where? At a Galilean wedding in Cana. He turned water into wine. A few months ago, we watched an incredible video here, and hopefully we will again before too long. And that video showed us how impactful that story in the Bible of a Galilean wedding uh, represents the Lord Jesus as the bridegroom and the church, his bride, at the end of time. It's an incredible story, surely worth knowing in greater detail, but again, I need to be brief just to make a valid point for our text today. But the entire church age, as defined by a new covenant established by Jesus at his first coming, is predicated on the traditional wedding feast on the first, at the first century. The wedding began with a betrothal, an engagement. Uh, from there, the, the bride with her bridesmaids would prepare for the wedding. The bride's primary interest is in getting ready, getting ready for the wedding feast and her, her, her new life in a new place. And then the bride and her bridesmaid would wait in their wedding gowns. Uh, to, to be alerted by a shofar, a, a trumpet blast that the bridegroom was coming for his bride. Now, during the same time of, of waiting, the bridegroom would return to pre prepare the wedding chambers. In John chapter 14, Jesus assures his disciples, he says, in my father's house are many rooms. And if it were not so, I would have told you. And, and I, uh, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you also may be where I am. The Galilean wedding. So neither the bridegroom nor the bride would actually know the exact date. Only the bridegroom's father would know. And so the bridegroom and the bride would be in waiting until they got the notification that the time had come. Jesus says here in verse 32, but concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but only the father. Be on guard. Keep awake. For you do not know when the time will come. Christian believers, that is Christ's church, his bride, must be awake. Be alert, be prepared for the time that Christ, the, the, the bridegroom, comes back to take us to be with him so that we may also be where he is. Amen. Are you with me, folks? Yes. Now, sometime in the middle of the night, only known to the father of the bridegroom, he would then notify his son, 
Go get your bride, son. Go get your bride. And, and therefore, the bride had to be ready. The church, the bridegroom, would then sound the shofar, the, the trumpet blast, so that the bride and the bridesmaid would then come out and join them in the street. And it was there that the wedding procession, making sure that they had enough oil to light their lamps. So the bridegroom would then place the bride in a seat to be carried away, carried to the wedding chamber where the marriage would be consummated. It's important that the bride and her maids uh, make sure that they have enough oil to light their lamps. The oil, of course, is a reference to the anointing and to the Holy Spirit for Christ's bride, his church, to be allowed to enter into the chamber, she needs to have the oil of the Holy Spirit. The message that Jesus gave to us, if, to his disciples, you remember Matthew 25, the story of the ten virgins, speaks to this very same principle. If you remember in that story, there were, five, uh, there were ten uh, virgins Five of them uh, were prudent to have their flask filled with oil while the other did not. What happened? Only those with the oil, only those with the Holy Spirit were allowed into the wedding feast. A Galilean wedding would actually last for seven days. And so the door would be shut for seven days. To me, uh, this speaks to me from my studies on this is to the pre-seven-year tribulation rapture since in this context, the, the seven days actually represent the seven years uh, of great tribulation. So Jesus warns his disciples to be on guard, to, be, to keep awake, ready or not. Here I come. The Apostle Paul writes to the church of Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians 4, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together, that we will be carried like the bride, that we will be, the word rapture comes from being caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord, Paul, Paul says, therefore, encourage one another with these words. Church families, church family, this is why I implore you with all urgency to discipline yourselves in the way that will make you ready. For if not Christ's second coming, surely for your inevitable death, one way or another, we must be ready. So how must we prepare? How, how does the apostle Paul encourage the Thessalonians to prepare? Well, for, first, for starters, he says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in verse 16, rejoice always, pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. That's for starters. Paul doesn't say in these words, of course, be in God's word, but you know that's a given. Because his word never fails. As believers in Christ, his bride, we are challenged to realize that our future home in heaven is being prepared 
And he is coming soon to receive us so that we can begin to enjoy the blessed hope that is promised for us as the new covenant believers, including an inheritance. Prepare, preparation requires us, folks, to be aware of his imminent return. As, as Titus 2.13 uh, encourages us, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of our, our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a, a people for his own possession, zealous for good works. In his second parable of watchfulness, Jesus described himself as a man going on a journey. Jesus, of course, would be returning to heaven. So in verse 34, he says, it's like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home, he puts his servants in charge each with his work and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. The disciples who are left behind are there to carry on their work. The doorkeeper, a servant, is commanded to keep watch for the master's return. The servants understand that they are in charge of themselves. They are responsible to have the, the, the work that they are called to do and not want, they surely don't want the master to return and find them lazy. We don't want them to return and find us lazy, do we? Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come. Each and every one of us has enough assigned work to do, kingdom work, right? We don't need to worry or get distracted about worldly stuff. No, we must devote ourselves commit ourselves to doing what God has given us to do. In these verses, folks, we, we see the evidence of Mark's Roman audience. See, Mark's characteriza characterization of the four around-the-clock watches of the night, did you see that? He says, in the evening or at midnight, when the rooster crows or in the morning. It demonstrates a Roman format. The, the Jews only had three night watches, the Romans four. The doorkeepers were never to be found asleep on duty, lest the Lord come suddenly and find you asleep. And as believers, we are to be ready and, and, and alert for Jesus' return, working for his kingdom, both because we know of the certainty of his second coming and also because we don't know when he will return. And also because it's important for Jesus to remind us, if not one more time, stay awake. I should probably add and another one is because we love them. We're, we're ready because we love them. On the urgency of this matter in, in the Christian life, the impending return on, on the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to read to you a quote from one of my favorite theologians, Dr. Wayne Grudem, who is the author of my systematic theology book. And, and so please listen carefully as I read uh, Dr. Wayne Grudem. I quote, do Christians in fact eagerly long for Christ's return? The more Christians are caught up in enjoying the good things of this life and the more they neglect genuine Christian fellowship and their personal relationship with Christ, the less they will long for his return. 
On the other hand, many Christians who are experiencing suffering and persecution or who are more elderly and infirm and those whose daily walk with Christ is vital and deep will have a more intense longing for his return. Watch this. To some extent, then, the degree to which we act, actually long for Christ's return is a measure of the spiritual condition of our own lives at the moment. It also gives some measure to the degree to which we see the world as it really is, as God sees it. And in the power of the evil one. End quote. Since I graduated seminary with a master's degree, I always wanted to continue my study in a doctorate program. Well, regretfully, I never did. I felt as I just could not juggle the, the commitment the, the devotion, the needs of First Baptist with the devotion that I would require of me to commit to that kind of goal. Now, how sad it would be if my reasoning for not going forward in, in that project was because I suspected that, that Jesus would be returning any day now. That would sound foolish, wouldn't it? Do you know that people actually think that way? People actually think that way, which is why Jesus would never tell us when he's coming back. How ridiculous it would be if, if I thought, well, what if Christ were to return the day before my graduation? Therefore, there is, there's no chance to be able to utilize my education to benefit my ministry. I mean, you don't let thoughts like that prohibit what the Lord has called you to do, do you? There's a story from 1869 where there was a really bad sandstorm somewhere out in mid-America. A judge is holding court when all of a sudden the sky outside turned black. And someone in the courtroom shouted, it's the end of the world. And so the judge ordered candles to be brought into the courtroom to say, hey, we ought to be busy doing what we ought to be doing when the Lord returns. If you knew that the world would end this week, would it alter your schedule in any way? I mean, w would you be canceling your vacation plans so that you can get your re reservation deposit back? <laughs> if you learned that Jesus was coming back tomorrow, would it make any, would it would you be making any effort or any greater effort, I should say, to share the gospel with your lost friends and dear loved ones, or would you just sit back in the satisfaction of your own salvation? Would you choose to tell more people about Jesus than you do right now? How would you, uh, how would knowing that the end has come change your life? What would change? Would you be doing what is more important to you or what is more important to Jesus? Is it any wonder Jesus wouldn't tell us when the end of the world would come, even if he knew at that time? Why? Because most of us might just stop doing what we're supposed to be doing. And what we should be doing every day is his kingdom work. Every day. We should be loving the unlovable and we should be caring for those who can't care for themselves. Every day we should be sharing the gospel 
and inviting people to receive Jesus into their lives. When we tend to marvel over all the magnificent creations of man, we tend to forget that one day it's all going to go away. And like God's word, only the things of God will last forever. We forget. So Jesus taught us to stay focused on what's really, really important. Jesus wants us to be engaged. Like a bride and her bridegroom. Engaged in obedience to him. No matter what our walk of life or up right up to the very moment of his imminent return. Friends, to be ready for Christ's return is to be faithfully obeying him in his kingdom mission, actively engaged in whatever it is that he has gifted you to do, whatever it is he has called you to do. And if you don't know what that is, please let me help you. Now, since we don't know the day of his return, on that day, there will no doubt be some who will have been trained to be useful for him, prepared to do his work that he has called you to do, and you will never be able to step one foot onto his mission field. But that's okay. Jesus wants obedience from us, not results. We, we leave the results up to him. I believe that the rapture is going to occur on a Sunday morning in worship service. <laughs> and that way, especially those who are left behind in the church will be the first to know exactly what just happened. So where will you be? If the rapture were to occur today, even before we leave here this morning, where will you be? Will you go up to meet Jesus in the clouds or would you be staying behind to face a tribulation? Will Christ's second coming be a blessed hope or will it be your day of doom? Will you be ready when Jesus says, ready or not, here I come. I want to pray in just a moment, but I believe it's important that this morning that we respond to God's word. And I'm going to give you that opportunity in just a moment. I'm going to ask Steve to play on the piano in just a moment. I want to invite you to come to the prayer wall. And deacons, I want to invite you to come up. For those of you uh, women who would prefer only to pray with a woman, my wife Judy will be here to pray with you. But the reason why these men and Judy will be here is if any of you here today need to pray to receive Christ, let me be available to you. You may have come here today, how foolish of me to think that none of you bring burdens with you into church. And I assure you, if your heart is laden with burdens, you're in the right place. Amen. And so, come and be with the Lord. Maybe by yourself, you in your little prayer closet right here at the prayer wall. Maybe you just want to pray with someone Somebody will be here today. But when you consider all the things that I've shared today, I want you to know more than ever that as we've talked about the end of the world, I want you to realize that the beginning of the world was that God loves you and he created you to love you yes. and for you to be loved and for him to love you and for us to love him back. And, and early on in, this, in God's story, 
That plan was uh, of relationship, to enjoy a, a personal, intimate relationship with God was thwarted when man rebelled against God and sinned. And sin broke the relationship that God had always intended. And each and every one of us, ever since then, in all of history of, of humanity, we have become sinners, rebellious in the heart, and broken our relationship with God when we sinned against him. But because God loves you, and he says, for God so loved the world, that was you, that he gave his one and only son. Jesus is God who became flesh because a man had to pay for man's sin and only a perfect sinless sacrifice was acceptable. So Jesus came to us born to die. He came on a mission to save you and me from our sin. And that's why he died on a cross. He not only suffered the worst pain that a human could through the uh, brokenness of his body and the shedding of his blood. But as he is nailed to that cross, he took upon himself the wrath of God, the punishment against sin that you and I deserve. Upon himself, he paid the penalty that you and I deserve, but he, he did so to spare us. But that's not the end of the story. Yes, he died. He was buried in a tomb, but he defeated death, the devil, and sin when he rose again on the third day. He revealed himself that he was indeed a risen Savior, human, and purified, perfect for us, but with the promise of eternal life if we would trust in him. As, as I said in early in our service, we can see all the signs of an eroding world. Sin is saturated in this world, but you can be saved from it, and you can be saved from the destruction that is in, intended to happen if you trust in Jesus to save you. He is not only Savior, but he is Lord. If, he, if you recognize him intellectually, say, I believe in Jesus, but you don't know him personally and intimately in your heart, I want to remind you that the distance between heaven and hell is about 18 inches. I want you to know him not only in your head, but know him in your heart. Invite him to come into your life. Recognize that you are a sinner in desperate need of a savior. Trust him. Lord, I need you badly. Come in and, and not only save me, but change me. I want to experience life in your favor. And I want to experience you personally and intimately. So I have this opportunity to do that right now. So... Steve is going to play. Deacons, if you would come forward. I'm going to come down and stand right over here. And you can either come to the prayer wall while the music is playing, if you just need to come and pray with someone. But get up out of your seats. Come forward as the Lord leads you. And if you need to receive Christ, let me encourage you and pray with you. You come now. Is there any conversation you need to have with the Lord right now? Maybe you need to have peace in your heart and you just need to come to him right now and say, Lord, I believe in you. I believe I'm saved. If I were to die today, I know I'd be in your loving arms, but I need healing right now. 
I'm not right with you. I need a stronger relationship. Maybe right now you just need to make peace with the Lord. So feel free to come forward to him. It shows him your intent and your obedience. I think God planned that just as I am, because that's how we come to him, isn't it? Thank you, Steve. Praise the Lord. Since we just uh, finished our offering, I just call your attention to keep uh, uh, your attention on the back page of your bulletin that, that kind of shares with what our offering um, schedule is or what the offering report is like, especially as we go into summer months and people tend to go on vacation and a lot of times their, their tithe becomes, pays for their vacation. So uh, follow that along so that you can remain uh, faithful as, uh, as uh, Brother Norman says, whatever, you know, comes in can, can leave. Lord's provision. And uh, likewise, the uh, uh, keep in mind and pray about the grant. That is the supplemental giving gift that you have toward a new youth pastor. Now, this past week, uh, Elaine sold the church van for the asking price, and that money is set aside for a new van when all of this comes to fruition. If we can build uh, a stronger children's ministry, build a new youth ministry, uh, that, that will help supply that. So just keep uh, the faith and particularly that your uh, giving will make a, a strong impact and difference on uh, connecting families to live changed lives in Christ. That is, is our uh, mission. Um, I want to mention again real quickly the, um, the Summerfest Fellowship, the, just a name for a fellowship we're going to do uh, next uh, week. L let's consider that like a high attendance Sunday. Uh, consider bringing a friend and who doesn't like to sit around a table and uh, eat and, and make new friends. If you know of somebody that's fairly new in the church, somebody that, uh, that you can bring to church next Sunday would surely be uh, great to do that. So keep that in mind. High attendance Sunday, uh, dogs, burgers are perfect for uh, summer and then you bring your favorite dessert. I'll love that a whole lot. Um, again, just in case you hear me say something wrong, like misquote a day or a date or anything like that, take the insert home, uh, magnet it to your refrigerator. Uh, uh, this isn't as good as the God is God's word, but it's pretty, pretty close. I probably I might even change. A, Judy Brown's service a little bit, but, but I ask you to do that. I want to brag on Jesus for a moment before we close. Uh, missions is really a, a big deal. Some people have asked me sometimes, 
you know, what, what mission work do you do? Well, one of the things, just to remind everybody and the newer folks that are attending today is everything about what we do at for, as First Baptist is on mission, and God has given us a mission field called Central Ridge Elementary School. So we're all about mission, going and sharing the good news. I want to encourage you to keep that in mind, to be a part of what God is doing, because when the school season starts up again, we're going to need more volunteers. You know, in today's age, you have to be highly qualified, you know, background checks and everything just to get in the school. But if, if you're gifted and called by God to serve him and he leads you here at this church family we need to be on the mission field together you may not be sharing the good news uh, with children but you might be in another volunteer position to build a relationship that opens up the door maybe with another adult now we do give missions also, something called the cooperative program. A part of everything you put in the plate goes to a greater cause, far greater than anything we can do as a simple little church. And so that's a great thing. But I want to brag on Jesus to something that we, we do every year. It, we've had bigger celebrations with CMA, Christian Motorcyclist Association, a large port portion of what they call Run for the Sun. This is an organization that Judy and I have been with for 15 years. Um, a great portion of, of their mission work is strictly to, to meet the motorcycle community, which some of you may immediately start thinking motorcycle clubs or gangs or this and that. No, anybody that rides two or three wheels uh, the, is for the gospel. But every year when we hold a single day event called Run for the Sun, you often participate in some way or another to give. Last couple of years, I've kind of sold you some tickets to Angelotti's. So if you go get a spaghetti dinner, part of that goes to the mission. You know, whatever way we can do. I'm hoping one day, uh, maybe next year, we'll ha have another big motorcycle rally and that'll be a lot of fun. Three missions that they support. One is called um, Open Doors. That has to do with the bracelet that you see me wear. They're ministering with uh, Bibles to people that are being imprisoned, tortured, and uh, 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 some of them end up being executed. But when they minister to, to them, um, it, it is valuable to keep Christianity strong where it's against the law. The other one is called the Jesus Film Project. You may remember that uh, from years and years, and now it's been translated into hundreds of, of different languages. And uh, the average person who sees that film, um, for every dollar that's spent, someone is saved. That's pretty incredible. All right. And the other one is called Missions Ventures, where a motorcycle or a, a unit of, <laughs> a mode of transportation is given to itinerant pastors. And uh, sometimes motorcycles are, are very valuable to that. And so in that uh, essence, the, the goal of trying to supply all of those ministries, the goal has been like $5 million a year. Not until COVID actually hit in all the years of CMA, did they ever hit the goal? Which maybe it just means that you're giving more or they're growing. But uh, this weekend, uh, the national rally was held and announced that they not only hit their goal of $5 million, but it was $5,768,408. Amen. <laughs> Which means is that every one of those missions that I mentioned gets like $1.5 million. So if the Jesus film is going to show the video to 1.5, uh, if, if the Jesus, show, excuse me, if they show the Jesus film, approximately the results will be that 1.5 million people get saved by it. So just think about how incredible the work that you do, the gift that you give affects somebody's life for the kingdom. That is, that is incredible. It is far-reaching 
for the kingdom. We, we sometimes have to see uh, God's perspective outside of our own scope of vision. And, uh, and I just hope for you that God is working in a great and mighty way. So uh, with that, who's praying this out? Are you praying this out? Okay, all righty. Uh, the degree to which we actually long for Christ's return is a measure of our spiritual condition in our own lives at the moment. Dear Lord, I just pray that we will have that degree of longing for you right now, mm -hmm. of your return, dear Lord, but also as a part of that, may we have the urgency to go and share your love yes. to our neighbors, to our friends, to our families. May that urgency be just so real right now and this week, Lord, as we go out. Guide us today, be with us, and uh, we just give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Our doxology today is the family of God.